to have Mr. Clark with us. Uh, you know uh, the routine. We'll have uh, about 45 minutes or so uh, hearing from Mr. Clark, and then he'll give us a few minutes for Q&A. And uh, at 7 o'clock, we'll end. So uh, everyone stay here until 7 o'clock. And then we'll invite you out to the lobby for an ice cream social, and uh, we'll ask uh, Mr. Clark to uh, join us there uh, if he's able to do that, okay? Uh, tonight, uh, we've got uh, Ken Snyder, who will introduce our speaker, and uh, appreciate you being here. Thanks, Dan. No. So, so, so for... For those who don't know, know me, I'm one of the associate deans here at the business school. I'm in charge of administrative affairs in this school. Um, and then I have to confess, I've known Mr. Clark, or to me, Danny. Uh, <laughs> so he calls me Kenny, too, probably. So that's OK. We grew up together in, this, in the avenues in Salt Lake. We attended junior high and high school together, played a lot of basketball together, had a lot of fun together. And I was thinking I could tell some stories about him, but then it dawned on me, I turned the mic over to him. And he can tell stories about me. And I thought, hmm, that's probably not a good scenario, so we probably ought to avoid that. So I'll give more of a professional explanation of my relationship, sorry, uh, with, with uh, Dan. Uh, and I'm, so we leave high school, I went away to college. And the next time I probably had a chance to see Dan was at our five-year reunion. And the only thing I remember about our five-year high school reunion was, I, and I was at the time living in Japan, I was on a homestay, and I just arrived in, just in time to go to the reunion. And I remember being so jet-lagged that I couldn't even remember the names of food, and I certainly don't remember who I saw. And so... You know, I was, I was telling some of the people at my table that, yes, you were jet-lagged at that reunion, you know. <laughs> but I don't know if you remember that reunion or not, <laughs> but uh, I don't. <laughs> but then I saw him a few other reunions, but, but the time that really sunk home about what great work Dan was doing uh, was in 1996. And at the time, I was president and one of the senior executives of a company called Taylor Corporation. It's one of the largest privately held companies in the US. And I was running a, a, a company, a very successful company for Taylor Corporation. And, and once a year, we had an executive retreat. And over the course of the 17 years I was with Taylor Corporation, we invited all the top people in the business world to come be a part of our executive retreat. We had Jim Collins come visit us twice. We had Tom Peters, we had, you name them, and they came to our retreat, and we paid their fees and had a great time with them. And then one year in 1996, I remember this very distinctly, in 1996, they invited Dan Clark. And they sent out this bio information about who's coming, and I go, that's my Dan Clark. What's he doing coming to speak to our executives? And then I got in, read, read a little bit more about it, what he'd been doing since high school, and I thought, wow. I know this guy, and he's now famous. <laughs> and it was really fun. Unfortunately, I did not attend that executive retreat. My dad died that week. And I ended up having to spend the time with my family and my, my dad's funeral. But then I go back to work, and all of, so this is my friend who comes to speak. And then we had, uh, so all of my colleagues that I work with all the time go to this retreat with him, and they just raved about what a great job he did. He's just as fun now as he was in high school. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dan Clark. You never know what your friends are going to become. Sometimes they become really accomplished professionals. That introduction pretty much sucked. <laughs> That didn't, build, Amen. Amen. <clears throat> that didn't build my credibility at all. <laughs> I'm excited. At least he didn't introduce me as a motivational speaker. I hate these guys. They're always shallow, and they say weird things like we become what we think about, and we know that's not true. If that was true, I'd have been a woman by the time I was 12 years old. 
I want to be an inspirational speaker. And I know this is an entrepreneurial ship lecture series, so you probably come to hear stories about how people, you know, came up with an idea and made a few bucks and left. I want to do something a little different. Because I'm a storyteller, I'm the primary contributing author to all the Chicken Soup of the Soul books, if any of you have ever read those. We, uh, we are still in awe, coming out with about five new volumes a year, about how those three and a half page stories literally change people's lives forever. Question and answer guy. I don't think the answers are as important as asking the right question. So question number one for the evening. Do you believe we can talk about some things in this amazing hall and broadcast to the 19 satellite locations across uh, the states? This, been, this is being, uh, being broadcast, right? Yeah. And, and probably recorded then. Unless you tell us we can't, we do it. No, no, no. I just wanted to say hi to our friends in Singapore. This is a big deal. Yeah, this is... <laughs> Yeah, thanks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to shout out to Tawilla right now, right out of the chutes. You know. <laughs> Do you believe we can talk? Do you really believe we can connect at a level where we can leave this, this little theater, this, this, this meeting room, different than we were when we arrived? I do. And if that's not the essence of entrepreneurship, I have no idea what it is. Because an entrepreneur basically finds a way to connect at such a level that they create so much value that when people leave him or her, they say, I like me best when I'm with you. I want to see you again. So, answer once and for all. Do you believe that one moment of time changes everything? Yes. Proof. I was on the program with Henry Winkler, the Fonzie from Happy Days. Uh, he played the father in the movie Holes. For those of you who have never seen Happy Days, you need to Google that. You've missed on, out on some serious Americana. Fonzie was the coolest guy who ever lived. And I'm on the program. And we, he decides he wants to take some time off, treat himself to a matinee movie. So he slides in through the side exit door of the theater. And as Henry Winkler shuffles himself through the aisle, he finds himself a vacant seat. As Henry Winkler turns to sit down in the chair to look up at the movie screen, the little girl sitting right behind him smiles this giant smile. She points her finger and slowly says, Fonzie. Henry Winkler immediately snaps into the Fonzie character from Happy Days. Hey, whoa. And the lady sitting next to the little girl passes out. <laughs> Henry Winkler milks the moment. Whoa, I thought this only happened on TV drama. Hey, how cool is this? Whoa. Theater manager comes out, takes care of the woman's needs. She's lying in the aisle, cold pack on her forehead. She's asked one question. Why did you pass out? She said, my little girl is autistic. And that is the very first word she has ever spoken in her entire life. No matter what our past has been, we have a spotless future. I'm glad you came tonight. Because we're going to laugh and we're going to cry. I want to take you on an emotional roller coaster ride so you'll never be the same. And then maybe let you off the hook by lip syncing three Ashley Simpson songs. <laughs> so you don't feel like you're in church or something real dumb. I'm a fan of quotes. May I lay a foundation for my remarks, for my stories that I've decided to share with you? Quote number one, we become the average of the five people we associate with the most. Look around this room. You came tonight because you wanted to, not because it was, it was compulsory for, for your class, I hope. And if it is, I can tell by the giggles, oh yeah, they told us we had to come. My job then is to make sure you're glad you did. Not for yourself, but because you made somebody else better. When we entered, we entered with the attitude, the entrepreneurship attitude. When the water in the lake goes up, all the boats rise together. Quote number one, we become the average of the five people we associate with the most. Which means we must be willing to pay any price and travel any distance to associate with extraordinary human beings. Hmm. Beginning of World War II, the Nazis are bombing uh, England, and uh, during the Battle of London, Winston Churchill, their brand new prime minister, is forced into an underground bunker. His responsibility as the leader of England, of the Brits, is to keep his people so fired up that they'll never say never. What would you say? Do you think words matter? Yeah. He's in an underground bunker, has access to the people he's responsible for as their leader. With a microphone, he says, it is not enough to say, I will do my best. We must succeed in doing that which is necessary. That is a good quote. 
I did my best. You did? Are you sure? We're going to talk about that. Because if you want to be an entrepreneur, you've got to figure out a way to come up with a product, a service, an idea that's different. And it doesn't have to be best, because best is only relevant depending on what you compare it against. Someone says, oh, Dan, you're the best speaker we've ever heard. Well, that's because I followed some bonehead. That's not a compliment. I, no, 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 I didn't talk about the person who introduced me. I'm talking about another speaker in your entrepreneurship program. I'm sorry, Ken. I don't mean that. No, that's not what I meant. You get it? Great is not good enough. Jim Collins, come on. 50% of those, of those examples related in Good to Great, which is one of the biggest best-selling business books of all time, over 50% of those are examples are obsolete. Great is not good enough because great always changes. Best is only relevant depending on what you compare it with. So at some point, we've got to figure out a way to be different and just fire up and make sure everybody else is better because they associate with us because of our product, our service, our idea, our personality, our character, whatever the case may be. So how dare I said I did my best? Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. How about wealth flows through you, not to you? You can get anything in this life that you want if you're willing to help enough other people get what they want. Is that not entrepreneurship 101? Wealth flows through you, not to you. You can get anything in this world that you want if you're just willing to help enough other people get what they want. So on that foundation, let me introduce a concept. I'm really proud of this. I have a brand new book coming out. It's my 21st book. It comes out tomorrow. Do you believe in what you're doing? Do you believe in a product or a service? Will you, when you start your own business as an entrepreneur, believe in what you have to offer, that your value proposition is so amazing that you will never accept no for an answer. I'm on the program, huge international um, insurance convention. And prior to my speech, uh, this gentleman, this top of the table, million, million dollar round table insurance advisor, financial advisor, is given 15 minutes to share his story. The coolest thing was they invited his wife to introduce him. Highly educated, very very well thought of in her own corporation, has this amazing uh, professional career. And yet her introduction of her husband was very short and very simple. I'm so proud of what he does for a living. Isn't that cool? And then he takes the microphone. What does he say? On September 11th, when the terrorists attacked our country, not just into the Pentagon and not just uh, Flight 93, United Flight 93 that went down over the, over the, the fields of Pennsylvania and Somerset, but those, those jets that crashed into the World Trade Center killing thousands and thousands of people, this guy was the insurance executive, and two weeks after the terrorist attack on September 11th, David Buckwall, this guy, my new friend, delivers 51 death benefits checks to 51 widows who lost their husbands that day on September 11th, and attended all 51 funerals. Can you imagine? And so in his 15 minutes in front of his colleagues, what does he say? I am so glad I didn't take no for an answer. I am so glad that I believed in my insurance product to the degree that I knew they knew, I, I, I knew that they needed what I had to offer. And sure enough, two weeks after he had attended his, his last of those 51 funerals, David Buckwall gets two phone calls from two other widows in the same day. Hey, I was just going through my husband's things. He lost his life at the World Trade Center. Could you check on this $2 million life insurance policy? And he does some research, has to phone both of these two widows back and say, I'm sorry, your husband stopped paying on the insurance premium six months ago and there's nothing we can do about it. Do you believe in you? Do you really believe in you? That's the question because entrepreneurship in my mind is finding who you are, why you do what you do, and then the rest seems to, to fit into place. Let me share a quick background check. I played football for 13 years. One day in practice, the dream ended. We had a tackling drill. Coach blew the whistle. Two of us ran into each other full speed. Only parts of our bodies that made contact, Lyle's helmet hit my neck and my right shoulder, and we fell to the ground. 
When he got off of me, my eye drooped. I had loss of speech. I couldn't talk anymore. Right side went paralyzed. My arm dangled at my side. Coach comes running over. Clark, Clark, you all right? What happened? Rock and show, roll. Rock and show, mighty roll. Said, wow, man, are you from Wellsville? <laughs> Said, I'm just kidding. He says, you better just lay there. I said, whoo. A doctor that was present on the field, he came over and he examined me. He pulls the coach aside. He says, Clark's got serious nerve damage. In fact, he might even have serious brain damage. Coach looks at him and says, how will we ever know? Nice guy. <laughs> Finally, my eye went back to normal. My speech came back. I could basically talk again, but my right side stayed paralyzed. My arm dangled. I talked to it in a wooden move. Scared me to death. I stayed paralyzed for 14 months. I went to 16 of the very, very best doctors in all of North America. Every single one of them told me I would never get any better. Have you ever heard that? What happens if you believe it? You never get any better. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. If collectively we all look outside and it's snowing one day up here in Logan, and one of us says, what a horrible day, and the other person says, let's go snowboarding. The weather did not change. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. When someone's negative, I never take them seriously because that's a choice. And I won't let them rain on my parade. I've been there, and I know better. I'm rock bottom. I went to 16 of the very, very best doctors in all of North America. Every single one of them told me I would never get any better. And when you start believing that, you never get any better. So now everybody wants to know answers to the oddest questions. I've recovered, 95% recovery. My shoulder's still totally numb. The nerves never grew back, so I can't play baseball or football anymore. But now that I've recovered, I'm asked the oddest question. Clark, why did you stay paralyzed for 14 months? <laughs> what they're really saying is, hey, Clark, if you were going to get better, why did you wait so long? <laughs> and because they asked me that question, I think I have the right to ask anybody that question. If you're going to change, if you're going to really be the best you can be, what's holding you back? Somebody else? The weather? In my book, The Art of Significance, comes out tomorrow. What I did is I identified the 12 principles of success that make people successful. And I comparison and contrasted those 12 principles that are debatable and interchangeable with the 12 highest universal laws of life-changing leadership. A law must either be obeyed or disobeyed. And when we obey that specific law, we reap a specific promised reward. And when we disobey that law, we suffer a specific consequence. It simplifies our life, does it not? So I don't have time to talk about all the laws. I want to just talk about three. Law number one, practice obedience instead of free will agency, which is, just kills me. We have four ages of accountability in my mind. Eight, it's when the little kids start to get a little sassy. Twelve going to junior high, I'm going to middle school. I am now a man. <laughs> Chicks dig me. I'm starting to like girls and I hate it. All these 12 year old comments. Next age of accountability is 16. I can drive. I am mobile. And then 21, I can do whatever I want to do. You can't tell me what to do. It's my life. Let me live it. And that's when free will agency gets us in trouble because our free will takes away our free will. So in my book, what I simplify is it's not about free will at all. It's about obedience or disobedience. If I want to get from here to there, all I need to do is follow the plan, obey, stay in bounds, play by the rules, get up each time I'm knocked down, and I'm going to actually get from where I am to where I want to be. Instead of trialing my error, trialing and erring my way around, oh my gosh, what a drag, I hit the wall. When I could have just gone from point A to point B. So simple. And that sounds like we're preaching, eh? So what have I said now? Successful people get what they want. People who live lives of significance actually want what they get. Three quick stories. Some of you know my family. I have one son, he's married. Three single daughters. My middle daughter, she is the most extraordinary songwriter, written songs with all the biggest names in Nashville. Huge, big time. McCall. 
And because she goes to Nashville and she hangs with the rich and famous, they love her. She is so talented. She's written with all the songwriters of the year. She's big time. In that scenario with the rich and famous, a lot of the bad boys of the band are attracted to my daughter, and consequently, my daughter starts to be attracted uh, to the bad boys in the band. And I'm a conservative dad trying to counsel her, make sure you are careful of what you get, because usually we get what we ask for, you know, trying to be that counseling dad. And it never sunk in. Never. I just like the bad boys. And then one day I said, McCall, you're like a dog. <laughs> and I got her attention. What? Daddy? I said, yeah, you're like a dog. You're like a dog chasing cars. If the dog catches the car, what's she going to do with it? <laughs> and will she actually want what she gets? She'll get what she wants, but will she really want what she gets? Story number two, played football. The guy drafted in the second round of the... National Football League superstar with the Philadelphia Eagles. After two years, he's traded by Oakland Raiders. After four years in the NFL, he walks out of practice. At the top of his game, he walks out of practice, quits never to play again. Why? He loved being a football player, but he hated playing football. He got what he wanted, but he hated what he got. He loved the fame and the, the, the celebrity perks and the money. That gave him a successful existence. But because it was misaligned with his inner purpose and his, his voice, his inner voice, his real true purpose, he couldn't possibly enjoy a significant life. Third example, October 12th, excuse me, October 23rd. I went up into space. You should Google that. Dan Clark YouTube spy plane. YouTube's like a 15-minute video. Kind of cool. I went to the edge of space, 15 miles above the Earth's surface, and I was there for three and a half hours. A little space suit, the whole deal. It's cool. I could see the curvature of the earth. I could look into the blackness of space. I clicked off the hot mic, so I had no communication with the commander of my, 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 my aircraft. And I just, I absorbed the sounds of silence, man. It was just me, mono on mono with the universe. Unbelievable, pondering my eternity. Do you know what occurred to me? Everything we can take with us when we die, I had a board with me on that aircraft. Our education, aren't you glad you're at USU? Nobody can take it away from you. Our character, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you that matters. Our convictions, what do you really believe? We're all going to die, what do you really believe? And number four, did you really make a difference? Did your life matter? Did you really help other people become better today than they were yesterday and leave you saying, I like me best when I'm with you, I want to see you again? That's entrepreneurship. I'm going to come up with an idea that will change the world. I'm going to come up with an idea that will make everybody better. Hmm. Are we connected? Do you really believe we're connected? Let me see if I can draw out this little scenario in, a, in an understandable way. Part of the following scenario. One individual invents a significant invention that literally changes the world and outwardly admits that he, the inventor, was inspired by reading this book. This book inspired this inventor to invent this invention that literally changed our lives forever. So here's the question. Do we owe our gratitude to the inventor or do we owe the gratitude to the author writer of the book who wrote the book that inspired the inventor who invented the device that changed our lives forever? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Or should we thank the teacher who inspired the student to become a great author and writer who wrote the book that inspired the inventor to invent this magnificent device that changed our lives forever? Oh, wait, wait, wait. Or should we thank the old woman who worked hard and created this, this personal wealth, so she endowed a scholarship at a university that allowed this teacher to get a scholarship and eventually teach the student and inspire the student to write the book who actually wrote the book that inspired the inventor who changed our lives forever. Wait, wait, wait. Or do we owe the debt of gratitude to the old man, the hardworking man who delivered the wood 
that was used to build the hospital where this woman's life was saved, who a few years later gave birth to a little baby, who became an entrepreneur and made enough money to endow a scholarship that allowed this underprivileged young lady to go to college on a scholarship, who became a teacher, who inspired the student in her classroom to become a writer and an author, who literally inspired the inventor to get into the profession of invention that changed our lives forever. Are we not connected? Did that make sense to you? That's why it right now matters. And that's why I gave you those four quotes as a foundation. So the three of the, of the, of the, of the 12 laws that I want to focus in on, not number one, obedience, we, we dealt with that. It's pretty interesting. I, I challenge you to buy the book. Number two, We've all been raised, patience is a virtue, right? I don't want to get struck by lightning. No, it's not. Patience allows us to never begin. Any virtue taken to the extreme becomes a vice. Patience allows us to never begin. Patience says, I will wait my turn. I will patiently put up with my misery. I will patiently stay in a relationship that sucks. I will patiently stay in a school that's not delivering what I needed to deliver. I will just sit there and just patiently die. Are you kidding me? Let's talk. Most people live their lives hoping to be happy, but because we only hope, we never really are. Any of you guilty? Most people live their lives hoping to be happy, but because they only hope, they never really are. They're saving themselves for the senior prom and they've never taken time off to learn how to dance. Someday I'm going to do that. Someday I'm going to be this. Someday I'm going to... Are you kidding me? So perseverance is the highest law because perseverance brings with it purpose. Now back to my story. Let me conclude. The reason why I stayed paralyzed for 14 months was because I was asking the wrong questions. I was asking the doctors how to get better when I should have been asking myself, why should I get better? Once we answer why, figuring out the how-to is pretty simple. Why are you at Utah State University? Why are you enrolled in this major with entrepreneurship perhaps as your minor? Why did you come tonight? Why? Once we answer why, figured out the how-to is pretty simple. And why ties obedience to perseverance. But the first of the three promise laws that I really want to focus in on is law number three. Proactively stretch instead of change. Let's talk. How many of you are willing to change? How many of you are lying to me? Let's talk. Now, one of us woke up this morning and says, I think I'm going to be different. It's against human nature to change. Are you kidding me? They say the dog will not move off the nail he's sitting on until the nail starts to hurt enough. Do you agree? So change is always a reaction. That's why we resist it. We hate to change. It's against our human nature. When someone says, hey, uh, why don't you change? Uh, uh, what's your name, man? Ben. ben. Somebody says, Ben, change. What they're saying is, I'm sorry you were born flawed. <laughs> you came to this world ill-equipped, but out of the goodness of my heart, I'm going to bring in a lecture series, and you're going to attend every Wednesday night so you can put in what was left out at birth, you bonehead. Isn't that what, what someone's saying? Change. If they're a little more delicate with their wording, maybe they say, hey, go find yourself. Ever heard that? Go find yourself. Where do most people go find themselves? Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> we could hop on buses. I flew in from, Spring, from Steamboat Springs, Colorado today. Trust me. We could hop on buses. Tonight, we could pull into Boulder, Colorado, and when we pulled into town, we would actually see people walking out in the bushes with backpacks on looking for themselves. <laughs> Hey, finally nice to meet me. Where have you been my whole life? Hey, hey, come out from behind that little deal here. Hey, where have you been? Hey, what's my point? Self is not discovered. Self is created. So I travel the world. I love to ask people, what are you looking for in life? Do you know what the answer is? Happiness. Happiness. Happiness is not discovered. Happiness is created. Happiness isn't a destination of success, focusing on gaining something that's really impressive, Happiness is a never-ending journey of significance in search of the important. Happiness is created when we feel like we are valued. 
And unless we are valued, we can't be happy. And unless we are happy, we cannot be significant. And unless we're significant, we can't feel valued. And that's where the circle begins and ends. So we're not here to arrive at some destination. When I graduate, then I'm going to be somebody. You've got to live right now, every right now, because you never know what's going to happen, injury 101. Hmm. How many of you agree that change from the outside in is reactive change and it creates a victim mentality? Yeah. What's the victim mentality? We look outside, it's raining. What does somebody say? What a horrible day now. If you live in Los Angeles, California, and it rains, it actually dissipates the smog. You can actually see what you're overpaying for. It's a good thing. <laughs> but how many of us allow weather to change our attitude, which changes our behavior? Are we not all guilty? Especially here in Cache Valley. Holy cow. Remember the first time I played it? I played a football game up here. Oh my gosh, I, we came out of the locker room. I took a deep breath. My nostrils stuck together. I'm like, man, I'm a country songwriter, man. I'm going to sound like Willie Nelson. Maybe this is a good thing. <laughs> Let's talk weather. We live in Utah. When it snows in Utah, we ski. Anybody here originally from the south? Where are you from? Texas. I was in Dallas, Texas when it snowed at the Super Bowl a couple years ago. Charlotte, North Carolina snowed. Atlanta, Georgia snowed. When it snows in the south, you crash your cars. <laughs> Anybody here from the Midwest? Oh, yeah, where are you from? Iowa. Iowa. Illinois. Illinois. Minnesota, North Dakota, Wisconsin. When it snows in the Midwest, you fish. <laughs> That just kills me. Let's drink the bong water, cut a little hole, see what's down there swimming around. <laughs> Anybody here from California? Yeah, we love your country. <laughs> I was in Malibu Beach when it snowed for the first time. No one had ever seen snow before. All the crazies were out on the sidewalk going. <laughs> <laughs> they, thought it was, they thought it was cocaine from God. They're like, whoa, dude. I believe I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna save this, buy me a new F-150 on the weekend. <laughs> change from the outside in is reactive change and it doesn't get us anywhere. It's a consistent resistance to change. It's against human nature. So the flip side of that is why we're gathered here tonight. Do you agree that change from the inside out is proactive change and it creates power? Yeah, and how does it create power? We now believe that no matter what our past has been, we have a spotless future. We now believe that one moment in time changes everything. Think about the Fonzie story with the little girl with autism. So may I suggest to you that the things we title and label things, the words we use really do matter. If someone comes to you and says, I have, a, I have a problem, you say, no, 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 you have a challenge. Interrupt them immediately. No, I have a challenge. I have a problem. It's so insurmountable. No, I have a challenge. Bring it on, baby. Freud, Freud's uh, law of sublimation. Most people let anger or pain or hurt defeat them. No, you, you use that as a motivator. Somebody says, you can't. You say, oh, yeah, watch me. Yeah. If you look at yourself in the mirror as someone overweight, maybe sluggish, and you say, I'm a fat failure, is that positive, is that productive, or is that negative? So why do we go there? Do you know how easy it is to completely shift our, our energy level by seeing ourselves as someone who has been very successful at putting on weight? <laughs> and we realize I didn't gain it all at once. I bet I can't lose it all at once. I gained it one pound at a time. I can lose it one pound at a time. That stuff matters. It's not shallow talk right now, my friends. So instead of talking about change, may I introduce a new word, stretch? Law number three, proactively stretch instead of change. To illustrate stretch, I snapped my Achilles tendon playing basketball with the guys on my street trying to be 20 years old again. The gentleman who operated on my ankle, his name is Dr. Jim Morgan. He was actually playing in the game. He denies it, but I believe with all of my heart that he came up from behind me in the game and said, I need a new boat, and he pushed me down. <laughs> he, uh, he surgically reattached my Achilles tendon and put in a plaster cast for three and a half months. I got the cast off. I was immediately placed into physical therapy. Any of you ever been in physical therapy? Physical therapy teaches us two things that are relevant to this evening. Number one, I go to the physical therapist's office. He warms up my ankle. Then he takes the tip of my foot and he bends it and stretches it to a place it's never, ever been before. <laughs> and as I'm sitting there hanging on with visions of sugar plums pinballing around in my head, he lets go. <coughs> and it flips back into the exact same spot it was in before he started to stretch me. Wouldn't that be a complete waste of your, of your time, of your life? 
if I do everything in my power tonight to, to, to stretch you intellectually and emotionally, and you just leave this magnificent Huntsman School of Business and go back to your apartment, go back to your dorm, go back home and flip on back into the exact same spot you were in before you arrived. Do you realize most of the time that's what happens in classes? That's what happens in meetings. How sad is that? That we're jumping through the hoops for someone else instead of because we decide to. We're changing. We're going through the motions for someone else. But when we proactively stretch, it's because I know the value. And as I become better, I can make everybody else about, around me better. Seek to bless, not impress. Remember, wealth flows through you, not to you. You can get anything in this world that you want if you're willing to help other people get enough other people get what they want. Can I take you into the world of music? It's a good place to, to identify and, and illustrate stretch. When somebody says, how many, uh, how many notes are there in music? What do you say? Any musicians? Any musicians? Where? Right here. Yeah. What do you do? What do you play? What do you... I play piano. Very cool. How many notes in music? Uh, a whole bunch. They're like little white ones and those little black ones all along this little 88 keyboard. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Chopin. Most people say there are seven notes because we count them. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Contre mon frère. In the year 1685, a very famous music composer in Western Europe decides he wants more options. He's the guy that put the black keys on the piano. Isn't that a bad indicator of life and how we measure our successes and why we need to let go of success and live a higher law of significance? How many notes? There's seven, because those are the major things in our lives. We forget the in-between the notes, the minor notes, the little things. Have you ever been to Jackson Hole, Wyoming? It's family, we go there so often. I, I had this dream I wanted to scale the Grand Teton, 14,000 feet. What kept me from the summit the first time? It wasn't the boulders in the path. It was the, it was the pebble in the shoe. That little tiny unseen thing that rubs you raw until it cuts through. It's this tiny screw that, that stops the giant grandfather clock. It's the little things that irritate us in our relationships, and pretty soon they fall apart. In music, there are 12 notes, seven white notes and five black notes, a total of 12 notes in music, and those 12 notes repeat themselves every 12 notes. It's what's called an octave, as we see on a piano keyboard of 88 keys. What does that have to do with you? What does that have to do with my message tonight? Every single song ever written was written with the same 12 notes. Do you know this? The only difference between one song and another song is the order in which those 12 notes fall and the timing and spacing in between the notes. I wish I had a boombox up here. I could put on a magnificent display from the world of music to make my point. We could play a rock on a piano concerto using all 88 keys on the piano. We could play a little Wynton Marcella smooth jazz. I'm a rhythm and blues guitar player. We could play a little Stevie Ray Vaughan, a little B.B. King. We could play a country ballad like my wife ran off with my best friend and I'm going to miss him dearly. I'm a country songwriter, so go to Nashville about every six weeks. One of my best songs so far, had I shot you when I met you, I'd be out of jail by now. Are you tracking? You get me here, Eric? Or you know what I'm talking about, man? What's my point? Every single one of these songs in all four genres were written with the same 12 notes. So here's the question of the day. What's the difference between a hit songwriter and a lousy songwriter? They have access to the same 12 notes. What's the difference between a great banker and a lousy banker? They have access to the same economy, the same interest rates. I live in Salt Lake City, Utah. We bank at First National Bank of Morgan, Utah, up Weber Canyon. That's an hour, 60-minute drive one way. And never once have I ever asked what the interest rates are on our loans. If money becomes the topic of conversation, it means the presentation is weak and the relationship is non-existent. What's the difference between a great parent and a lousy parent, a great student and a lousy student, a great professor and a lousy professor? The answer is the same. The difference between a hit songwriter and a lousy songwriter is passion, creativity, and imagination. You want my take on entrepreneurship? Passion, creativity, imagination. You see, you, you focus in on words like innovation, but innovation always seems to indicate that it has to be about high technology. Isn't that kind of what we immediately think about innovation? Oh, you got to be high tech. Innovation, okay, what's coming next? It, 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 no, what if, 
It's not about technology. It's still about people. What if we allow technology to completely overrun us and you go to your doctor's office tomorrow and there's no human being? All you get is a recording. If your pain's below the waist, press one. Is that where we're headed? What if you're Catholic and they put the entire confessional system on voicemail? 1-800-FESS-UP. <laughs> if you're into bigamy, press two. If you're worshiping the devil, press 666. Is that where we're really headed? <laughs> Innovation's a cool word, but we got to understand what it really means. Passion, creativity, and imagination. Any of you into country music? Very cool. I love USU. I had my first gold record in country music with a guy by the name of Michael Peterson. We wrote a song called Drink, Swear, Steal, and Lie. Yeah, I'm an inspirational genius. <laughs> Some of you who really know me, like Ryan Murray, he's like, was that pre-Bish? Yeah, I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Teamed up with the great songwriter Don Schlitz. He wrote, you say it best when you say nothing at all. That's a good song. He wrote The Gambler for Kenny Rogers. He and I teamed up. We put Kenny Rogers back on the charts. Little boy in his baseball hat stands in the field with his ball and bat. He says, I'm the greatest. He throws the ball up, swings, misses strike one. Throws the ball up, swings, misses strike two. Throws the ball up, swings, misses strike three. He's out. What does he say? Yeah, man, am I a good pitcher. That's a good song. You should watch the music video. My best love song so far. Uh, it's called Real Man. Visualize Faith Hill singing it, not me. I need a man who knows happily ever after is a day-at-a-time proposition. A man who knows making love is not a three-minute composition. It's a slow dance full of romance, a walk on the beach in the sand. It's having a whole conversation just by holding my hand. He would stir deep desire that sets me on fire to be with him all that I can. No, no, I won't settle for anything less than a real man. Chorus. A real man strong in stature, firm in faith, and kisses slow. He sometimes cries, and when we hug, he's the last one to let go. Worshiping the ground I walk on, he's my biggest fan. There's nothing like being loved by a real man. Most of you women are looking at me like... <laughs> These ladies right here, you're all looking at me like, do you mind if we smoke? <laughs> oh, Dan, could you, re could you repeat that one chorus part? And most of you guys are looking at me like, oh, perfect. <laughs> I was interviewed on country radio in Nashville, Tennessee. They said, how does a linebacker write a song like that? I said, it was easy. I made a list of things I wasn't. <laughs> And I decided I could become them. Not because it's expected by others, but because it's demanded of myself. Who is stretching you? Let me invite you to the National Football League. I'm paid huge dollars to work with NFL teams. When I walk into an NFL meeting, there are 53 elite athletes who collectively represent over $105 million in annual salary. That's sick. And I'm supposed to say something or use an object lesson to fire them up and take them to the next level? Isn't that my assignment tonight? And because you're all here, I know I look at you in the same way. You are elite athletes. You are here just trying to stretch, trying to figure out who you can hang out with because we become the average of the five people we associate with the most. I want the most extraordinary experience from Utah State University I can possibly get. What's the definition of a best friend? Someone who brings out the best in you before you can be that kind of a, excuse me, before you can have that kind of a friend, you have to first be that kind of a friend. Remember when the water lake goes up, all the boats rise together? Any of you have horses? Any of you ever seen a horse? <laughs> when you put a hard-to-catch horse in the same field with an easy-to-catch horse, most of the time you end up with two hard-to-catch horses. In the human condition, when you put a healthy child in the same room with a sick child, most of the time you end up with two sick children. Moral of the story, to be disciplined, healthy, and great, you've got to hang around with the disciplined, healthy, and great ones, the significant ones. That's why you're here. When you're a parent, you don't want your kid go, go, to go to school healthy and come home with bronchitis. Do you, Natalie? No. And you're like, how dare this irresponsible parent send their sick child to cough and sneeze on my healthy babe? You know anybody who's negative and cancerous, just in their attitude, who makes you sick to be around? Are you one? Let's just pause for a second. What are people saying behind your back? Do you ever wonder? Army sergeant calls and he wants an inventory check. Young private answers. Sergeant says, give me an inventory. He says, we have 1,500 rifles, 10 tanks. And one fat-headed sergeant, sheep sergeant, says, what? Private says, yeah, we have 1,500 rifles, 10 tanks, one fat-headed sergeant, sheep. Sergeant says, do you know who this is? Private says, no. Sergeant says, this is the sergeant. 
Travis says, whoa, you know who this is? Sergeant says, no. He says, good, bye-bye, fathead. <laughs> I am sorry I told that joke. What are people saying? Are you real? Are you going to stretch and proactively make a difference in people's lives? Yeah. Let's take it to the next level. I work with an NFL team. <clears throat> My job is to take them to the next level. What would you do? Let's ask some questions. Can you motivate these 53 elite athletes with money? No. Nope. Why do we know that? You'll eventually run out of money. I have friends who make millions of dollars every year and they're flat broke. Money's not a motivator. This is entrepreneurship, right? If the reason why you want your own business, Vincent, is because you can make money and nobody tells you what to do, that's a wrong motivator. On the back of my book, one of my, my prize testimonials is from John Huntsman Sr., benefactor of this entire operation. You know what he says? He says the book validates says some nice things, and then he says, uh, Mr. Clark's work affirms my belief that the best exercise for the human heart is reaching down and lifting another up. Money's not a motivator. We know that. Can you motivate these 53 elite athletes with, with uh, benefits and bonuses? No. Who are we fooling? And with Obamacare coming, it's going to be a little more difficult. Can you motivate them with um, rewards and awards? Absolutely not. What motivates them is the same thing that motivates us, same thing that inspires us, expectations. Hey, how are you, man? Good to see you. But Mr. Glauser, one of my clear heroes, if you could talk to me for 60 minutes, 15 minutes of it would be sucking up to him and his mind and his, his generosity and his ability to attract people who are amazing. And the guy sitting next to him, Sean, he was one of my students in my, my uh, public speaking class when he was in the MBA program at Westminster. I love this young man, so sharp. But they're not motivated by money. They didn't say, hey, Clark, will you come up to Utah State and speak for some money? He set an expectation that, yeah, maybe I could say something that would make a difference. I'm like, I'm all, all, all there. Can't say no to him. Glad he didn't ask me for a new truck. <laughs> so let's talk. If you can't motivate these elite athletes and you can't motivate you and you can't motivate me with money or uh, benefits and bonuses or awards and rewards, what motivates them is what motivates us. Expectations. Here's the object lesson. Ahead of time, I get a, a captain of the team and an assistant coach to hold a broomstick 12 inches off the floor. And ahead of time, I get the name of the best, the purest, most amazing athlete on the squad. Every one of the 32 NFL teams has at least one guy on their roster who can leap <clears throat> 38 inches high. Do you know how high that is? Without any inertia, without any running start, he just stands there and goes, <laughs> eats a Big Mac, drinks a Diet Coke before he lands, <laughs> you're like, dude. <laughs> and this prima donna is always in the back row, huh? So I call him out by name, and what's his reaction? Every single time, why are you bothering me? Don't you know who I am? Don't you read my newspaper clippings? I read my newspaper clippings. Why aren't you, like, respecting me? So I relentlessly call him back out, and finally his teammates clap him up to the front. It takes him 22 and a half minutes to walk up to the front of the room. <laughs> he passes by two rookies. They said, he, he said on something hot. No, he just thinks he's all that. He finally gets to the front of the room. Here's the captain, here's the, the, the assistant coach. They're holding the broomstick 12 inches off the floor. He's now standing in front of it, and here's the engagement. Here's my question. Think you can jump over that 12-inch high broomstick? <laughs> so now I change the question. Will you jump over that 12-inch high broomstick? He always pacifies me, skips over, and then stares me down. And I stare back and say, why did you only jump 12 inches high? When you and your teammates know you can jump 38 inches high. And the answer is always the same, Ben, because that's all you asked me to do. How high is your bar right now, regardless of your age? How high is your bar? How high should it be? How could it be? Who's stretching you? We become the average of the five people we associate with the most. You put a hard-to-catch horse in the same field, an easy-to-catch horse, most of the time you end up with two hard-to-catch horses. 
It's important for us to choose our friends and focus in on law number one, obedience instead of free will agency. I can do whatever the flip I want to do. I'm now an adult. We all can name people who should never get their driver's license regardless if they're 16 or 75. <laughs> Age has nothing to do with maturity. Age has nothing to do with anything. Bless you. Oh, yeah, come back again. That's, <laughs> it's, it's like, that's what I'm talking about, man. If you're going to sneeze, you do it to the very best of your ability. <laughs> Let's jump to the second of three promised uh, laws that I want to talk about. And gosh, I, I keep the reflection. Now I look up and I'm, I'm running out of time. Okay, I won't talk about three, but I got to tell you the story. Do we have to end right at 7, or can we go to like 701, 702? You'll leave when you want. I know. I'm 21. I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> Some of you came in with scissors in your hand just because you can. You're like, just, <laughs> my mom ain't here. She can bite the wall. Okay. Uh, dang, I got two stories I needed to share. Dang it. Okay, let me just get into this. <clears throat> Uh, Lana, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> this is just to make sure you're still awake in the 19 satellite places. <laughs> Law number 10. Love and be needed instead of romanced and used. Is that a business principle? Absolutely. Is that a law? Oh, yeah, the highest law. So I just need to share this, and it will tie into a true message of entrepreneurship, so I do uh, what I was asked to do. Back in the 1980s, between 1983 and 1989, I was the guy in the Reagan White House that did the Just Say No program, Positive Choices Assembly program to thousands and thousands of high schools in all 50 states and all 10 provinces of Canada. And in that period of time, I spoke to over 6 million teenagers, kind of a cool legacy. I'm really proud of that. If you go into an elementary school area and you see the Red Ribbon Week, Drug-free school zone, I was in the meeting that created the Red Ribbon Week. I'm really proud of that legacy. And during that period of time between 83 and 89, 1983, 89, we had a suicide epidemic, and it's now starting to raise its ugly head here in the, in the 21st century. Brutal. I was flown into Plano, Texas, the Beverly Hills of Dallas. They had... <clears throat> They had six suicides in their high school in one day, seven in the same week. I was flown to the shore of New Jersey, Ocean Township, Asbury Park, Long Branch. They had several suicides in a day and a half. I was flown into Dubuque, Iowa, Hempstead High School, 2,100 students. In the 30 days prior to me coming to their school, they had 100 suicide attempts. One young lady died, 99 survived. I was flown into town with a woman by the name of Charlotte Ross from San Mateo, California, the national co-chairperson for suicide prevention. So because she was the expert, wrote the books, was on the talk show, she took charge. She comes into the school, <clears throat> excuse me, she divides the 2,100 students in half. She takes half of them into the theater. She does the left brain cognitive cycle babbling neurotechnical junk. I'm not slamming education, but I was not on the honor roll every time. One time I came home with a report card, had four F's and one D on it. My dad's response, son, looks to me like you're spending too much time on one subject. <laughs> And y'all keep that in mind. <laughs> knowledge is power, but knowledge has no heart. All the information in the world is going to make a person successful. It's like the guy who has three PhDs, one in philosophy, one in psychology, one in sociology. He doesn't have a job, but at least he can explain why. <laughs> this is what makes us significant, what we're talking about and how we're feeling in the process. And that's what makes you a successful entrepreneur, guaranteed. So I take the other half of the student body into the gymnasium. I did the right brain, touchy-feely, emotional, relational stuff. We swapped audiences, repeated our performance. And at the end of the day, we invited the healthcare professionals, the student uh, counselors, and the school administrators in. And we interviewed every single one of these students who had attempted suicide and survived. Every single one of them told us the reason why they wanted to kill themselves was because they lacked commitment relationships in their lives. Do you? What's a commitment? Two-way deal, we're running out of time. 
When you say what you're going to do and I say what I'm going to do, there's no commitment. When you do what you say you're going to do and I do what I say I'm going to do, a commitment is formed. And like we've said many times, when the water in the lake goes up, all the boats rise together, right? Cool. Let's deepen our understanding of commitment. Any of you in love? That's funny. Yeah, right here, my guy. Your bride, right? I could tell she was your wife. Because I said, how many of you are in love? She raises her hand, she looks at him, and he goes. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron. Do you agree that love is a commitment, not a way of feeling? Think about it. Romance is not love. Romance comes from a Greek word that means erotic. So I don't even want to talk about it. But if I love, what's your name again? Amber and Brooke. Amber, if I love you because you're beautiful, that's romance. If you're beautiful because I love you, that's real love. It's a value-creating love that inspires us to be the best that we can be. Yet, how many of us confuse love, commit with romance, emotion? What have we said our whole lives? Oh, I love her so much, she makes me feel differently than I've ever felt before. Oh, I love him so much, he makes me feel differently than I've ever felt before. So do beans. <laughs> if you think you're in love, just maybe you need a long, cold shower and a box of Rolates. What's my point? I love you means absolutely nothing unless we back it up with action. The three more most powerful commitment-oriented words in this world then are not I love you, regardless of what movies and music try to force feed us. The three most powerful commitment-oriented words in this world are I need you. If I come up to Amber and say, I, I love you, she's like, oh, there's a lawsuit. <laughs> but if I say I need you, she's like, Whoa. not that you're a dog. Whoa. Where's the fire? We can put it out. If I could convince every single one of you in this room that you were needed, there's no doubt in my mind you'd follow me right out the door. There's nothing we cannot accomplish as individuals, as couples, as a, as a class, as a school, as a community, as a world. Proof. I got into music in a very, very interesting way. Good friend of mine, Jeff Soderberg, he decides he wants to get married. He decides he's going to invite me to write a song for his wedding. Calls me up. We write a song for my wedding. I said, sure. He said, will you sing it? I said, no. In the next few minutes, he convinced me that we were best friends, that we went back a long ways. That it would be cool if I participated with him in his special day. He made, basically made me feel important. Think about that word for a moment. We like to feel important, don't we? In fact, most of us try to act more important than we really are. That's why we have so many people driving around with trailer hitches on their cars and they don't even own anything to pull. Like, whoa, follow her. She's got two trailer hitches, must have a boat and jet skis. I said, all right, I'll do it. I wrote the song. Two days later, he phones me back. Clark, the band just called and canceled. Could you prepare about 40 or 50 songs and play for the whole wedding reception? I said, no. He said, I need you. What a jerk. <laughs> Had he said, I love you, I'd have said, I love you too, man. Here's the number of a band. But he made me feel like I was not just good. I was good for something. That my little weird-shaped puzzle piece really did fit, that I could make a significant contribution. I couldn't turn him down. I don't think you could have turned him down either. I practiced. I prepared. Finally, his wedding reception rolls around on the calendar. He makes a big deal out of my first little love song, gathers everybody around. I said, I'm, I still played my little song. Everybody's crying. They disperse, start to have their refreshments, start to socialize. I sang the first song out of the 40 or 50 songs that I practiced and prepared. And all of a sudden, the band shows up. Miscommunication. I'm not foolish. I don't want to sit on a stool and sing all night. I want to eat like everybody else does. So I gladly help the band set up all of their equipment. Now you think about this for a moment. When I arrived at that wedding reception, I arrived with the attitude in mind that I was needed. I would have stayed till 4 o'clock in the morning if necessary because I was needed. I would have waited tables. I would have swept the floor. Somebody spills, I wouldn't have waited for a custodian. I had ownership. Give me the mop. I would have cleaned it up. I would have sung 100 songs if necessary. I would have made some up. But the second the band shows up, realistically, I am no longer needed. We can fool others, but we can't fool ourselves. And when we no longer feel needed, why hang around? And I left the wedding reception. That's why we have such a high suicide rate in our country right now. 98 suicides in the United States Air Force, which I'm so involved with, just in 2012. That's why we have a 50% divorce rate in America, 67% divorce rate in second marriages, 72% divorce rate in third marriages, 90% divorce rate in fourth marriages. See, I came here to talk about the fundamentals of entrepreneurship, which relate to every aspect of our lives. Because if money is not the motivator, it's making a difference. Now we're talking entrepreneurship. How can I make a difference in my community? What can I come up with as far as idea? There's no such thing as a financial crisis, only an idea crisis. Ideas create income. 
And yes, we need to know all the economic terms and we need to understand how to balance this and how to read a ledger and we have to understand how to just do the whole business aspect of it, but that's not what makes us significant and allows us to leave that, that long-lasting legacy that we're all talking about. Hmm. Are you needed? Right now, who you are, are you needed? If not, why not? And if when, why not now? If you don't feel not needed at school, participate more. Get involved. If you don't feel needed at home, participate more. Get involved. If you don't feel like you're needed in your children's lives, if those of you who have older children, Participate more, get involved. But here's the kicker. Because of the society in which we live that we've all helped create, we can't afford to wait for somebody else to tell us or show us that we are needed. It might not ever happen. We have to do something on a daily basis to prove to ourselves that we are needed. So the kicker word in commitment relationships is to participate more, get involved. I want to just tell you one more story, but I, gotta do, I, I just got to tell you this for Mr. Glauser's sake. My story is so simple, and I know she's like, oh, my gosh, my watch stopped. I got to get out of here. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> my, st my story is, is, is so boring to me, but I suppose maybe some of you would find it fascinating. After I got hurt, paralyzed, and I started to get better, the way I got better was somebody brought me by a cassette tape to listen to by a quote, motivational speaker by the name of Zig Ziglar. I thought, whoa, his mom ran out of names. <laughs> so out of curiosity, I played it, and it changed my whole life. That's why I'm here. That's why I believe in what I do. And Zig Ziglar comes into town. And uh, I wanted to position myself backstage at one of these big positive mental attitude rallies so that I could stop him. And sure enough, I did. Zig, you changed my life. I was down, paralyzed, blah, blah, blah. Listen to your tape. Can I take you to dinner? He said, I'm coming back in three weeks. Call Lori, major in my office, and uh, set up an appointment, and you can uh, hook up. We can hook up when I come back to Salt Lake City. Cool, huh? Except prior to that, you got to understand something. When I'm hurt, and I'm devastated, and I don't think I can go on anymore. Have you ever, ever, any of you ever been there? A phone call comes into the University of Utah football office that says, will you send somebody to talk to our football team because you turned your season around from three wins and eight losses to eight wins and three losses, and I'm in the office that day. Just came back from a doctor's, another doctor's appointment. Coach Howard says, Clark, will you go up and speak to the, to, to the team in Morgan, Utah? I said, yeah, I drive, up Mor I drive up Weaver Canyon feeling sorry for myself, crying. I'm never going to play football again. It's my dream. I'm the biggest, the fastest, the strongest I've ever been in my life. I'm ready to go, and now I'm, I can't do it. And feeling sorry for myself, I park my car and walk around the corner, and here comes our coach, Jan Smith, in a golf cart makeshift wheel, wheelchair deal. He has multiple sclerosis. And suddenly I don't feel sorry for myself anymore. And I spoke before seven of their eight football games. They won the state championship that year. His principal was impressed. We speak to our student body. I said, yeah, I got a couple of my buddies. We spoke to their student body. He called five friends, spoke to Bonneville High School the very next time. And we spoke to five high schools that, that year. The next year, spoke to 13 high schools. And I started thinking, there's something to this. I had this idea, wow, I can make a difference. I can do something to prove to myself that I'm needed. I'm no longer an athlete, but it dawned on me that football is not who I am. It's just what I did. And when we identify ourselves in terms of what we do instead of who we are, we become a human doing instead of a human being. Unacceptable of significance is what we seek. So... I speak to 13 high schools with some of my buddies, and then I start thinking, you know, I could turn this into a, into a, a full-blown deal if I, if I really took it seriously. So I positioned myself, met the people, networked with whomever I needed to network with, met a guy by the name of Doug Miller who invited me to come to Utah State University to be a keynote speaker at Utah Business Week. And there I met Fred Ball who introduced me to somebody else, and I ended up making my presentation to the Utah State Office of Education, and then they invited me to go and speak to the Utah State Legislature at the Capitol Building. Wow. I dazzled them, and they decided to fund my high school assembly to ha have me go to and speak to every single high school and junior high in the state of Utah, 172 schools. Then they refunded it the next year, and that's what I was just coming off of when Zig Ziglar came to town, and I said, you've changed my life. I want to take you to dinner. Call Lori Major. You can pick me up at the airport, I find out. He flies in. 
I pick him up at the airport, drive him to Hotel Utah, which is now the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. And in the 15 minutes that I, from, from the time I pick him up at the airport to drop him off at his hotel, I have convinced him that he needs to see my program. I got a slideshow. I got the projectors. I got the little, you know, I, I mean, I had everything you could imagine. Dick Norris, little recording. And by the time we walk in the door, he goes, is there anywhere I can see this program? I say, yeah, I just rented the small ballroom right off the side of the lobby. I got it all set up for you. He thought that was amusing that I had that much confidence that I could convince him to watch it in a 15-minute drive from the airport to downtown Salt Lake City. And I cranked that baby on. I got the slides going. I'm doing my whole little thing, a little movie clip. 45-minute show. Mono on mono. Me, Zig Ziglar. And when I finished, he stood up and gave me a standing ovation. And he flew me down to Dallas, Texas the next week to speak to his corporation. He sponsored me in the National Speakers Association. We met for six to seven days in Chicago. Invited my wife down to, to Texas to the uh, Born to Win seminar. Introduced me to another guy, Dr. Jim Kinniger, who said, you know, let's just speak in Atlanta, Georgia, to about 2,000 educators. If you do well, I'll, I'll book you nationwide. And if you don't do well, we'll just shake hands. And oh, I'm, I'm sorry I ever met you. I'm thinking, perfect. I show up, brand new flannel, not flannel, brand new gray polo suit. Yeah, yeah, you came in my pajamas. I was really good. <laughs> brand new polo suit. I'm backstage. I'm fired up. I'm like pacing. I'm like, man, I got to dazzle these folks. And chivalry is not dead. There's two women, not that you're weak, but I just wanted to be a gentleman. And they were lifting this big, heavy box. I said, may I help you? I reached down to lift up the box as he starts my introduction. And my pants rip from the bottom of my zipper to the top of my belt loop. Ladies and gentlemen, Dan Clark. <laughs> and I'm here to fire you up. <laughs> and thank God it went well. And he booked me in a 14 of the, nat of the 16 National Student Organization conventions that year. And I was up and running, started my own uh, leadership, summer leadership camps, had eight summer leadership camps in five states for five years. Leadership Development Institute still runs to this day. I'm really proud of that. That's my story. It's all about connections. It's all about who do you want to meet. Four degrees of separation is how I want you to leave, how I want to leave you. We hear about six degrees of separation. In my experience, four degrees of separation. You go to my website, Dan Clark Speak. I've met everybody you can imagine. I've interviewed all of them. I set a goal. I say, who do I know that knows somebody that can know, know somebody that can introduce me to somebody? Guaranteed, I've interviewed everybody I've wanted to, to, to meet. Spent four and a half to five hours in Muhammad Ali's living room in 1988, 1988 before his Parkinson set in. I was the state Golden Gloves boxing champion. He was my hero. I get to meet the, 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 the greatest boxer of all time. Are you kidding me? And I'm in his house watching his big screen, watching his greatest fights. It can happen to you if you just wanted to. And you're willing to do what you need to do. With the motivation that you're on earth to make a difference, seek to bless, not impress. Who's stretching you? How high is your bar? Do something on a daily basis to prove to yourself that you're needed. That's entrepreneurship 101. And when you do, sometimes you'll realize at the end of the day with a 30-second vignette to close, the words actually get in the way. That entrepreneurship is just being there when somebody needs this and you feel that need. You have that vision where you can see the niche opening up and you're like, I can figure out a way to fill that niche. And I challenge you to do that because you can because the answers are in the box. You don't think outside the lines, you think inside the lines. Expand your box. So the 30 second close, if you wanna help me with my book, the national strategy from the publisher Penguin is that you all buy the book from amazon.com tomorrow at 12 noon and I get on the bestseller list. Kind of a crazy idea. And you get a 37% discount. I've never sold books from the middle of the stage in my whole entire life but I'm doing it right now. You know why? Because the three laws that I've just dabbled in tonight are all covered in the book. Every story I've shared in the book, I mean, tonight is in the book, and I guarantee it'll transform your life. I've seen it. And more importantly, I've experienced it. 30-second close, the reason why I came. A mother encourages her daughter to come home as soon as school is over. The time comes, the time goes. 30 minutes later, daughter walks in through the front door of her home, and her mother scolds her. Where have you been? I've been worried sick, she says, oh, mommy. 
I walked my friend Sally home. She dropped her doll on the sidewalk. It broke all to pieces. It was awful. Her mother said, so you're late because you stayed to help your friend pick up the pieces of the doll and put it back together again? She said, oh, no, Mommy. I didn't know how to fix the doll. I just stayed to help her cry. Entrepreneurship from Dan Clark 101, I'm here for you. No matter what, I'm going to figure out a way to help you. I'm going to figure out a way to help our community. I'm going to figure out a way to help our school. I'm going to figure out a way to help our, our, our roommates. And when you start thinking in those terms of service before self, you become the consummate entrepreneur. With passion, creativity, and imagination, guaranteed you will change the world. I had a slide I wanted to show so you could have a way to text. Do you want to put that up or not? Not a big deal to me. I'm done. He already left. He had to attach the cab. I know. You have a flyer? No, no problem. So as I start to get undressed in front of you, if you had any questions, you're just going to have to ask Mr. Glauser. And I will see you in a moment at the Ice Cream Social, and then I'll answer your questions. So thanks for having me.